Good to see everybody. Welcome. Glad you're here. Um, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Acts 28, but then you can also turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at two passages of Scripture tonight, continuing in our sermon series, talking about being unhindered as a church. That's the whole goal, that we would be unhindered to share the gospel of Christ with boldness and without hindrance. And this is the theme that we are pursuing as a church family. Many of you have been here, so you know what's going on. It's an exciting time in our church. It's a time that's just uh, amazing to think about what God has in store for us, and we're really looking forward to all that he's going to do. And I want to share with you some information, more information about how we're going to actually continue to roll this out as a church family. This is a different season for us as we work through these six weeks and talk about the future of our church and the vision of our church. And I want to roll out each week just a little bit more information to you. But today, I want us to talk about being unhindered in our hospitality. I was thinking about hospitality quite a bit this week. Most of you saw the, the video that went viral on social media about the Houston Astros fan that was at the Yankee game and he had beer thrown on him and popcorn and all that kind of stuff. He had to be escorted out. They actually put him in a better seat, so he was thankful for that. But I thought about, you know, hospitality and the whole idea. And I want to be quick to say that those fans are not, I'm sure, characteristic of all Yankee fans. So we're not placing general judgment. But the ideal here is, what, well, what would happen for people to come into our home <laughs> and into our home stadium and what would be the response. So I found an article actually in the Houston Chronicle about that. It says this, Cruz Arcia Jr.'s exit from Yankee Stadium section last week went viral. Uh, ballpark staff in New York escorted the, Yankee, the Astros fan up the stairs as Yankee fans hurled expletives, popcorn, and beer at Arcia, who appeared to embrace the onslaught. He was pretty laid back if you saw the video. The Astros fans behind him gasped after a pint of beer landed on Arcia's shoulder. The episode in New York begged the question. This was a question I was asking myself. How do fans of opposing teams fare at Houston's Minute Maid Park? Very well, according to Nationals fans at Game 2 on Wednesday. They treated us very kindly so far. We enjoyed every inning, said Larry Teague of Leesburg, Virginia, who attended Game 1 and who was back on Wednesday for Game 2. Let's put it this way. We're not in New York, <laughs> is what he said. So Adam Mayle, a Maryland native who made the trip to Houston from Michigan, where he now lives, describes the reception in the city as amazing. It's unlike anything I've ever seen, said Mayle, who said he has been to every major league ballpark. Not just the stadium, but people walking downtown at restaurants. I think they're just happy that we're not Yankee fans, is what he said. Even his mail made his way out of the ballpark on Tuesday night. That's when the Nationals, of course, you know, won. And uh, he said fans remained friendly despite the Astros' loss. They were like, hey, good game, Mayo said. He, and then he said this, people have been super warm, super friendly, and super welcoming. Uh, one even went out of his way to recommend Mexican restaurants near, near the ballpark, which is, a, of course, a Texas thing to do. Hospitality reveals character, doesn't it? It really does. And it expresses acceptance. And if there's, if there's any entity on the planet Earth that should be hospitable, it is the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, for us to be a place of warmth and love and acceptance. But I want to say to you that it's becoming a rare commodity in the body of Christ. We need to embrace this whole thing. The Bible has a ton to say about it. So let's go back to our key passage, the unhindered passage in Acts chapter 28, verses 30 through 31. Here's what it says. This is, this is the theme throughout this whole series. This is the apostle Paul who was now in prison in the city of Rome. He was under house arrest. He had a Roman centurion. He was in chains and he was awaiting his trial before the emperor, but Paul didn't stop ministry. His ministry was unhindered despite the fact that he had these very real kinds of adverse situations in his life and these challenges. Here's what it says. He, Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense, and he welcomed all who came to him. That's what we're going to look at tonight. He welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now, if we look at the dictionary definition of hospitality, it's the quality of receiving guests and strangers in a warm, friendly, generous way. That's fine, but what does the Bible have to say about it? The word hospitality is a Greek word, and that Greek word is philoxenia. You've heard of xenophobia? 
which is kind of a political phrase that's being thrown around. Xenophobia is a fear of strangers or fear of people who are different from us. The Bible shares the exact opposite concept. Philo, meaning love, uh, xenia, strangers. It literally means the love of strangers. This is what the Bible teaches. And it's all over the Scripture. Not only do we see commands for it, which I'm going to share with you in just a moment, but there are examples of it all throughout the Bible. So if we look at the Scripture, we see in Hebrews 13 too, that there should be hospitality towards strangers. Towards strangers. Do you remember this verse? It says, be hospitable to strangers because you may be entertaining angels unaware. That's what this is. So you never know who a stranger might be. Be hospitable toward them. 1 Peter 4, 9, that we are to be hospitable toward those in the body of Christ, that we are to teach, treat each other with respect and hospitality and love and acceptance. Of course, it's to be true of the body of Christ. But then here's something interesting. What you see in 1 Timothy 3 is that it is a prerequisite and a qualification for those who are leaders in the church. They are to embrace strangers. So in 1 Timothy 3, it lists the qualifications for an elder, a pastor, a leader, an overseer of the church. And that person is to be hospitable. Now, when we turn to Ephesians chapter 2, what we're going to see in the first several verses of Ephesians 2 is Paul outlining uh, who we are in Christ and all that we have received in Christ. And then when we turn to chapter 3, we're going to see what we're to do with all that. So there are some attitudes about hospitality that the Apostle Paul had. When we look at that phrase, he welcomed all who came to him. He was open. He was receiving. He was welcoming and warmly receiving those who came to him to share the gospel of Jesus and he was simply giving to them what he had received. That's the point, okay? That's what we want to look at today. So in Ephesians chapter 2, there are really three components of hospitality I want to share with you. The first one is this. Hospitality is about making room in our hearts. We've talked about this theme before. What we're talking about here is an attitude of the heart. We're making room in our compassion in our emotion of compassion for other people. And so the ideal here is that we were strangers and aliens, but God took us in. I was just thinking about that. As we were singing that uh, song, Reckless Love, the overwhelming love of God. He left the 99. He chased me down. And I was just worshiping. I was, and I had this moment I just thought about. I remember, I remember when I was lost, when I was apart from Jesus. Some of you grew up in church. I did not. But I, I remember a feeling of a fear of death and a feeling of utter loneliness as a teenager and a feeling of, of not knowing who God was and not feeling his love. And then I came to saving faith in Christ and was brought into the family of Christ through the death of Jesus on the cross. And this is what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 2. Look at this, but God... Those are two really good words, by the way. <laughs> but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace that you have been saved. What an amazing, amazing truth. So making room in our hearts is the first attitude of hospitality. And believe it or not, churches sometimes have trouble with that because they like everybody that's in the room. But they're not too crazy about those who might be new. And we want to make sure that we have the attitude of hospitality. Secondly, it's about making room in our hope. And here's what I want to say, is that the gospel is inherently about hospitality. The gospel is hospitality. So this is not just making room in our hearts and our compassion. What I'm talking about here is making room in our theology, it's a theological basis that we would extend the love of Christ to those who are outside of it. So the truth here is this. When we were without hope in the world, God adopted us as his children. Here's what it says later on in Ephesians chapter 2. Again, the whole chapter is filled with this, this idea. Remember that at the time, at that time, you were separate from Christ. And can you just kind of go back and remember that time for a moment? Because I think we tend to forget. You were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope 
and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And there are many, many people who are far from God. And our church is to include in all that we believe the idea that God wants to reach people with his love. And he wants to use you and me in the ultimate act of hospitality, God provided a way to welcome us into the family through the death of Jesus Christ. And he extends that to all. And here's the third attitude here, making room in our home. Making room in our hearts, making room in our hope. The hope that we have, we're to share, but also making room in our home. And what I'm talking about is the spiritual home, the spiritual family, making room in this family. The ideal here is when we were without a home and family, God brought us into his uh, some of you grew up in very strong and stable and secure and loving family units. I didn't, and I'm not complaining about that. It's just one of the things that we didn't experience. One of the huge blessings that I found as a result of becoming a Christian at the age of 17 was being adopted into a family. And I knew immediately that I was loved and accepted, and I had brothers and sisters in Christ, and they became closer to me than literally my blood family. They became my family to me. in such a powerful, wonderful thing. And folks, I don't know if we remember that, that, that truth, that the ideal here that there's so many people who are lost, so many people in our world who don't have people that they can truly depend upon, who love and accept them for who they are. It's just not common in our world. And so the church, the gospel, offers this unique proposition to those who are outside of faith in Jesus. And so it's all about making room in this spiritual family as well for those who are far from him. Ephesians 2.19, going down further in Ephesians 2. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. And what? Members of the household of God. We are all in this room members of God's household. There are different pictures throughout the New Testament of that family. One of them is the, the picture of the kingdom which is to come. If you read in the book of Revelation, you will read about the great wedding banquet, the great wedding feast where family and friends are all together. We just had a wedding in our family not too long ago. We had to see that, that great celebration. And so that's what the Bible is describing, just being close, this great wedding banquet. The Bible talks about heaven being a place of many rooms in God's house. So this is the idea of family. And again, I remember feeling family for the very first time in the strongest way possible when I came to Christ. So we think about making room in our hearts, our hope, and our home, our spiritual family. Now, all these things are true, right? What we have received is the whole ideal. This is what he's outlining. But what we have received is not just for us. If you look in Ephesians chapter 3, I'm not going to show it to you here on the screen, but let me read it for you. So now we turn the page. We go from chapter 2 to chapter 3. After Paul's listing all these blessings about being in Christ, he now says this in Ephesians 3, this mystery is that the Gentiles, remember those were the outsiders, those were the strangers. The Gentiles are fellow heirs. This was huge theologically. <laughs> because now the gospel, Paul's saying the gospel is for everyone. Anyone and everyone is now a recipient of the gospel. He says the Gentiles are also members of the same body. Whoa. And partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is radical stuff. And then he says this, of this gospel, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. He said, of this gospel, I am now responsible to share this gospel with all those who are far from God. And guys, that's the point, is that what we have received in Christ is not just for us. We're to share it with other people. And this is particularly interesting when you think about the Apostle Paul's background. You probably know that. He, he, was, he was a Jewish leader, formerly a Jewish leader. And in fact, he was persecuting the church of Christ. And he had this amazing conversion experience. God radically redirected his life. And so now this guy who was once the greatest persecutor of the church became the greatest missionary for the church. 
And this amazing transformation that took place, you know, what was it that took place in Paul's life that would cause him now to not keep it to himself, not to hold it for himself, not to grasp it for himself, but to say, I am called to be a minister of that gospel? What was it? Grace. This huge veil that was uh, torn down of grace in his life, where he saw and experienced grace for the first time. One who had tried to live up to the standards of a, of a law-keeping kind of religion now had ran like a Mack truck into grace, and it absolutely changed his life. And because of the grace that he experienced, he wanted other people to experience the same. And I want to remind us that people who understand grace, who really get it, and people who regularly experience grace are the ones who want to give it to others. And when we hold it, and when we keep it, and when we harbor it, and we hoard it, that's when we lose an understanding of the grace that was shown to us. But we tend to forget, don't we? We tend to forget. Remember Jesus told a parable about this very thing. Remember the parable of the unforgiving servant, the unforgiving debtor? A man who owed another man a great debt, huge amount of money, one that he could never, ever repay. He went to that man and he pleaded for forgiveness and he pleaded for grace. And the man had compassion on him and showed him grace and forgave him the entire debt. That very man had someone else who owed him a very small debt. And that very man chose not to forgive the one who had small debt toward him. In fact, he threw him in prison. And this other master found out about this. And he, he, he had him bound in chains and cast into prison himself because he was unwilling to give to others what he had been given himself. Now, the Bible always pictures sin in the term of debt, in the concept of debt, that we owe a great debt that we could never, ever pay off. That's the point of the story. And yet the master has forgiven each and every one of us of a massive, massive debt. And the ideal here is that we are to give to others the grace that was extended to you and me. So why? How could that guy go away and not extend grace to someone else or forgiveness or mercy to someone else? Because he didn't fully understand what was given to him. He lacked a perspective about the grace that was bestowed upon him. And so what I want to say is that there's this tendency for people to forget where they firm, formerly were apart from Jesus. Let's not do that. Let's remind ourselves often that we are sinners that are saved by grace. And that pride should never take over so we get to the point where we withhold something from others that we once received ourselves, that we were once lost and separate from Jesus ourselves. There's also this tendency to forget what others did for us to help us arrive at the spiritual place that we are. God used people in our lives to share the gospel with us. People made room in their hearts. People made room in their hope. People made room in their home, their spiritual home for us. They extended the family of Christ. And so that's what we're to do. Hospitality is rooted in grace. A lack of hospitality is rooted in a lack of grace. Now here's the key concept for us, okay? Gospel hospitality truly is generosity. It's being generous with what we have been given ourselves, a willingness to give, giving to others what has been granted to us. Why do you think this thing of hospitality is so important to God? <laughs> Why is it so important to God? Because it's at the heart of the gospel. Giving ourselves to others as God gave to us. For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave. He gave his only son. So, as we think about hospitality here at the Brook Church, and we kind of bring this home to application, what are we trying to do? We're trying to turn honored guests into cherished family. We want to be sure and be a church that doesn't become isolated and insulated. And we, don't, we want to be a church that is willing to engage the mess of inconvenience for the sake of other people. We want to be a church that's not a holy huddle. We want to be a church that extends and broadens the family. 
of Christ to those who are far from God. This is who we are. And I want to remind you that this has been who we are since day one, since 1995. So as we look back, as we're doing every week, we're look, looking back at these different locations. I just want to illustrate for you how that was true. I told you the story last week about how we opened our home. And we had led some neighbors to faith in Jesus. And we just began meeting in our home to start the Brook Church in January of 1995. And then we went to Yeager Elementary School. We figured out a way to make that happen. We leased that facility and uh, pulled in the truck and trailer and unloaded everything, had a worship service, packed it all back up, and it went into storage. But here's the thing I want to tell you about that many of you don't know about, and that is the retail center at Grant Road in 249 when we went there in 1999. Brent Lee is in the back. He's uh, working and volunteering with our tech team. He came to our church at that point in time. Here's what was going on. So this was formerly a cloth world. Maybe you remember the old cloth world stores. This was an old cloth world that had been abandoned, but it was all had walls on the inside of it. And, you know, even stuff. We saw beer cans. I've got pictures of beer cans and like a beer uh, display. And uh, we thought about leaving that in the lobby, but we thought that maybe that wouldn't be the best thing to do. But um, anyway, it was kind of used for storage. And so we went in there and we were able to raise some money just for less than 50 people in the elementary school at that point in time and go in and renovate. We did all the work ourselves, almost all the work ourselves, all the walls, all the painting, everything related to it. And so we gutted the whole thing and we created a room for worship, and we created a room for children's ministry, and things were so tight back then as we, we had so few volunteers, and we were, you know, doing whatever we could do to make the church happen. I would preach in the worship service. Actually, I would teach in the children's ministry, and then I would run into the worship service, and I would preach the sermon. <laughs> And, you know, a couple times a month, me and the kids would go up and we would clean the church, mop the floors, clean the bathrooms. But this is what it was. This is, this is what it took. And there were other people who came alongside. We weren't the only ones doing that stuff. But those that were there paid the price and sacrifice. What did they do? That small group of people made room in their hearts for others, made room in their hope, and made room in their home, their spiritual home. So exciting to think about this. And just again, the price has been paid all along the way. And then in 2009, we came out here. 2012, we bought the additional six acres of property. And then in 2017, we opened up our children's building. Now, these are the facilities. These are the locations. This is the geography of the church. But I want to remind you again, each and every week, because I want to make sure that you understand that this is not about bricks and mortar. It's about ministry. It's about discipleship. It's about reaching people. Ultimately, it's about building the kingdom of God, not our kingdom. That doesn't matter. <laughs> it's about building God's kingdom. But God uses these things, and I've pointed out to you before, he uses these things to achieve this. And this is Dennis O'Brien, a young man sitting right here on the front row every Thursday night. And I remember Dennis's baptism just a few years ago. Uh, Dennis will tell you a story, but let me relay some of it to you, okay? Uh, he struggled with alcoholism for many, many years, and I think it was in 1976 76, that he broke free from the addiction of alcohol and came clean and started going to AA meetings, which he's still attending now after all these years. But he moved to Houston five or six years ago, and he uh, moved in with his sister, and her husband, Tom and Nancy Wilson, and they received literally him into their home, opened up their home, extended their, their home to him. And then as he came, he, of course, saw them and came to our church and grew in Christ and gave his heart to Jesus. And this is his baptism. And I remember him being uh, having tears in his eyes as he was baptized, this new life that he had found. Here's what he said. He wrote this for me. And I want to read it for you. This is, quote, I was, I was wrong the way that I lived my life. He said, I didn't trust God. Till I trusted God and loved people, that's when Jesus came into my life. I'm so grateful. If you talk to him long enough, he's going to share with you how grateful he is for the love of Christ in his life. But I'll tell you another thing that's true about Dennis is that he inherently understood early on that it wasn't 
just for him. It was for other people. And he is always sharing. He's going to AA meetings. He's sharing the love of Christ with other people. He's texting Bible verses to people. And he's talking to people about the hope that he's found in Jesus. That's what it's all about. So, again, this is a real person who found real hope in the real world. This is what we're about. So, reminding you about Unhindered, real quickly. Unhindered is our two-year discipleship and ministry initiative that allows us to what? Expand our reach, deepen our connections, and depend on Christ. Those are the three things. So, when we talk about expanding our reach, we're talking about making room in our heart, our hope, and our home. That's extending ourselves, our spiritual family, to those who are far from God. And we talk about deepening our connections. We're talking about building more love and unity and fellowship and acceptance here at the brook. And then about... Uh, depending on Christ, it's about growing deeper as disciples of Christ where we develop a true trust in Jesus. Not just a religious kind of experience, but a true living relationship with a loving God that causes us to depend upon Christ in the very real areas of our life. So in order to do that, we are moving to a phase where we are, we are going to expand this building. We believe it's God's will for us to move forward. And as we've taken steps all along in the history of our church, we've, we've made these big and bold steps, trusting God for our future. And that's where we are right now, folks. So we've been in this building for 10 years, as it is. And we believe that God is leading us to the next phase of expanding this building so we can expand our reach. I want to show you some renderings of this, okay? So this is what the renovation of this building will look like. It's pretty exciting. The front of the building will be pushed out, and we'll get to make the lobby bigger. We're working against ourselves in our lobby. And I know we don't feel it on Thursday nights, but we've got such crowding taking place in our little bitty lobby where it's like we're just kind of herding cattle, right? You know, pushing people in, pushing people out. And so we value community here at the Brook, and we value deepening our connections, and we want to be hospitable. And we're going to create some space in the lobby where we can actually practice hospitality in a much, much better way. So this is... Uh, the outside view of the lobby, and then here's the inside, just opening it up. It also provides more worship space for us in this room, and thereby we'll be able to have more at our peak, more room at our peak, peak services. Now, as we close tonight, I want to I want to give you some very practical instructions about how we're moving forward. I'm going to share with you some dates, but I also want to share with you some information here. The renderings are in your booklet, so if you have a booklet, you can open it up and turn with me. You'll see the renderings. I hope that you have one of these. I hope that you will read through this. I hope that you will pray over it, but then also you've been given a commitment card, a commitment card. Let me explain the commitment card to you, okay? People say, well, why a commitment card? Well, there's a few reasons. It allows you to pray in a specific and non-ambiguous way. I mean, we can pray about all this, but it allows us to pray, and it allows us to pray over dollar amounts. It allows us to plan. It allows you to plan as a family. It's a plan to sacrifice. How are we going to adjust? How are we going to make this happen, what God is leading us to do? How are we going to see God provide? It allows you to plan. But it also allows our church to plan. And by you participating, remember our goal is 100% participation. Through prayer, through you praying, and then you responding with this commitment card. It's allowing us to have wisdom and to plan our future. And by you letting us know what God has laid on your heart, then we can also plan and have wisdom as we move forward. Let me share with you the commitment card real quickly. Because there, there's some parts here that we've gotten a few questions about. I want to make sure that everybody is crystal clear. So the first line is all about what you normally give to the Brook Church. We're asking you to write that down. And we're, ta- we're asking people to maybe take these steps and think about where they are compared to where they believe God wants them to be. That's between you and God. But nonetheless, to indicate where you are currently, normal giving in one year, and then to think about how God is laying on your heart and to pray about, God, is there something more that we could do that we could increase our annual generosity as a part of the Unhindered Initiative so that we can achieve the things that we're talking about, expanding our reach, deepening our connections, and depending on Jesus to uh, infuse our budget with ministry resources, but also to help us with the capital expenditures that we're hoping and praying that God will provide. So put that down. And then you come to this. After that, you, you add those two things up, and you say, okay, I've got the total times two years. This is a two-year initiative. Please remember that. So people are getting a little confused about it. This is not a one year. It's not a three years. It's a two-year 
vision that we have for the brook, and you come to total that, but then you can think about something else. There are people who have asked us about stored resources. By the way, we're a 501c3 organization. And so some of you are in companies that will match charitable contributions to 501c3. So that's a great thing to do. Maybe that's the way you could do it. Other stored resources, such as stocks. You've got a car you can sell. You've got a boat. <laughs> you know, what, what's the saying? You know, the happiest day, two days of a boat owner is the day they buy it, the, ba- the day they sell it. So it's kind of one of those. Maybe you can sell a boat and, and, you know, or donate it to the brook so that we can see this vision come about. And then we total it up. And that's, that's your commitment total as it lists there on the card, okay? And so here's what's going on. Over the next few weeks, we're going to have opportunities for people to respond with their commitment card after prayer. Again, as God is leading you, all right? So we've got Advanced Commitment Night that's coming up really soon. It's next Wednesday night. Many of you came to Paysetter Dinners. Some of you came to Preview Dinners. And we shared with you the vision that God had laid on our hearts for the next two years. And so we have our leaders and our volunteer leaders and our volunteers who are now planning to come on this advanced commitment night. But there are some of you also who maybe weren't involved in those meetings who would also love to participate. We're opening this thing wide open to everybody and anybody in the church that's just ready to give. <laughs> and what, you know, and that's why we're coming out. And we're gonna have a we're gonna have a hoot and We're gonna have a church worship service just about generosity and giving. And I'm just praying the whole wave, and we'll just feel this amazing joy that night as we all give what God has put on our hearts to give. Well, that's next Wednesday night. We'd love for you to come if you can be there. It's open to everyone. And it's particularly our leaders are going to be present that night. And then we have commitment weekend. For those that can't be at advanced commitment, then the weekend of November 14th, which is Thursday night, and then Sunday the 17th is the commitment weekend where everyone in the church will come and we'll have a special worship service and uh, give the heart of generosity and joy and willingness to what God is is doing in our church. Now, just as a way of illustrating what we're talking about, I want to show you a video, a video of a guy named Daryl Burdett who hits the ball out of the park. He's right down the strike zone when it comes to what this is all about, how God has worked in his heart from the standpoint of our church and in this area of generosity. So let's watch this video. Hi, I'm Daryl Burdett, and my wife and kids and I have been coming to the Brook for a little over five years. If I were to describe the Brook in one word, I I would probably be genuine. Uh, The the people are are genuine, and that's what has has made me feel, when I first got here, I felt welcome, and I I, was self-conscious when I came here because I'd been away from church for so long, and then when I came back, um, just, I I didn't, it didn't feel fake to me. The people did not feel fake at all. They, they... They felt like genuine people who had their own problems and their own struggles uh, and that like nothing was being, there was no pretend to, to what they were doing and how they were, how they were being. The part that interests me most about Unhindered is I can't wait to see the untapped potential of the church body being released and going forward and, and to see what this church will be able to do. Once it begins to be released, just kind of, kind of starts this fire burning inside of everybody and, and, and it turns into to real joy for everybody. It's magnetic. There's something magnetic about people who have that fire in them and it draws draws people who who see that and they like, oh, I don't know what he has, but I want it. And that's what I, I hope to see uh, with this, uh, when, the, when the potential of the church is finally uh, reached. I try to be as generous as I can by, by tithing and giving of my time to serve in the kids' ministry. I get a lot of joy in and being able to, to do it, to, to give and be generous, whether with my time or, or money. Um, but it, I wasn't always like this. Um, as I thought back over the, over the last year or two about what it was that, that really uh, started this, um, I think it, did, it started when I was a kid, but um, I kind of forgot about, about it. Um, when I was about 14 or 15 years old, my, my parents had recently divorced. And all within about a year, my parents divorced, my mom lost her job, and then she got in a car wreck and broke her back. And there was almost no income in the house I was living with my mom. And uh, so I I knew at the time that times were tough. 
I didn't realize how tough it was. You know, I knew some people from her church were helping her out, getting her to the doctor and, um, you know, paying, paying a bill here and there. And, you know, that was, that was neat, but I didn't see those things happen. But the day that, um, the, the day that the doorbell rang, and I was home alone. My friend, my, one of my best friend's parents drove across town to give us, to deliver some, um, they handed me the envelope and just said, make sure your mom gets this. And I said, well, okay. And um, after I closed the door and you know, they turned around, drove all the way back across town just to hand us that. And I looked in there and I saw um, multiple $50 gift certificates. And that was when I realized, oh, things are that tough. Okay. Um, so as, as I look back on that now, over the last five years or so, probably the last four or five years, um, as I've gone, the, the, my generosity has, has increased. The drive, the drive for my generosity has increased. I look back and I'm like, I think that planted a seed in me. Their generosity is now continuing as I give. People at the Brooks should be generous because at some point, I'm sure someone was generous, generous to you. Um, uh, we're expected to, to, to give and give cheerfully. People at the Brook should give because if you, you want to change the world, you can change the world for one person. And you've, you've, you do one thing for one person, you will have changed their world. Uh, with those kids out there in the minist kids ministry, um, that's what I, I, I think of is, you know what, there could be something I say one day that 10 years down the road when they're about to make a bad choice, it rings in their head and they go, Okay, I'm not going to do this. Or you're just setting them on the path, the, the, the right path now, and they don't go through the struggles maybe that, that, uh, that we did um, by waiting longer to, to um, follow Christ and, and, and choose that path. But um, th there's no change in the whole world, but you can change the world over 5, 10, 15, 20 times. Oh, there's, what about some, some kid who wants to go, to go to one of the church camps but can't afford it? Okay, well, you know, oh, okay, you only have $10, we'll get the $10. $10 matters. Um, you'll get great joy, and, and there's a good chance that it, that it keeps going. It could go on for the rest of that person's life, and then whoever they're generous to in their person's life. Your legacy could be, I helped this one person one time. It's so good and so true when we've been recipients of generosity and when we've been recipients of grace, when we've been given to, and we really know that, then there's a natural organic desire for us to give to others. And that's what it's all about. Next week, I'm going to share with you the many ways that your gifts are working. I've been sharing some of one-off stories, but I want you to know week in and week out, your generosity is making a difference, and I'm going to share with you on a regular basis how your gifts are being used, and we just want to see more and more of it, and we want you to experience more and more joy in this area of giving. So the question for us is, what kind of church do we want to be? I know that, I know that many people will say, well, this is the kind of church I want to attend, but I want to change that a little. What kind of church do we want to be? Do we want to be a church that reaches others? Do we, do we want to be a church that's authentically worshiping Jesus? Do we want to be a church that truly wants to grow in Christ? Do we want to be a church that's accepting, that's loving? Do we want to be a church that's generous? Well, we are as you are. You are the church. We are the church. And some people have an idea about attending church. They want to attend a certain kind of church. But we are the church. And you are the church. So if that's what we want, then every one of us need to do our part. And that's what I'm praying each and every one of us will do. Let's bow in prayer. And let's thank God for our time. Father in heaven, we love you. You're so good, so generous. Thank you for the warmth of this evening, the, the filling of our hearts tonight. I pray that every person in this room would just lift up a heart of gratitude and thanks to you right now for the, the gift of Jesus in their lives. 
And thank you, Father, for the great joy and privilege it is to use a portion of what you've given us for the sake of your kingdom, God. You've been so generous and so loving and forgiving. And we pray, God, that we would be a church that just extends it to many, many others who need the love of Jesus. And that we could, in our church, our church family, experience that joy in amazing, amazing ways. I believe that your spirit will pour out on a church that embraces generosity and becomes generous. I believe that with all my heart. And then as Daryl said in the video, watch out for the full potential of the power of Christ and the full potential of a church that is awakened to the love of Jesus in such a way that would be practically expressed in our time, our talents, our treasure is just an amazing thing to witness. And the world is waiting for it, God. The world is in need of it. And I pray that we would be that place. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.